Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Hey, we want to thank one of our sponsors, Free Life Soap. You can go to the recoveringfundamentalist.com. Or click on their link, use the promo code RFP, and get 10% off of your order. They have beard oil, they have soap, they have shaving cream. They got all kinds of stuff at Free Life Soap. Go and be part of that. Also, J Radio, we want to thank them for sponsoring the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. We're not in the J Radio studios tonight. We are actually coming to you again from quarantine, it feels like. I'm in Ringo, Georgia, Nathan's in Trenton, Brian's in Danville, Virginia, It's quarantine all over again, fellas. JC, actually, this time I'm not in quarantine, but you are. Has your test come back yet? No, no test results yet. They said seven to ten days, but we're still waiting on that. So how you feeling? Everything's good. I just can't. I can't smell or taste, so I guess that means (laughs) I've got it. But other than that, everything's good. We had a kid woke up uh, Monday night, had a fever, and then by the end of that day. I started showing some symptoms and this is day what this is. So according to the CDC, this is day 10. So I should be okay to go now. Uh, It's taken longer to get my test results back than it is to actually have the virus. But Nate, I don't know. I think me and you had this. Well, Brian, you too, I guess, back in January when you were in town and I was sick as a dog in January. Like, I mean, I couldn't breathe. It was bad. This this is nothing compared to what I had in January. Maybe this the second like, go around, it's a little bit easier. Nate, you need to go get that antibody test, and you need to see if you had it in January. Because if I, had I think it, you, you gave did. it to us. Yeah. Oh, guaranteed. No Man, I was in a hotel room with Nathan. He was coughing his head off every few seconds. And then we woke up the next morning, and he's like, I'm going to take you to the Maple Street Biscuit Company. <laughs> <laughs> and we got there, and he never ate a bite. I knew he was deathly sick when they were pouring milk gravy over top of my chicken biscuit, and he didn't want anything but some orange juice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's when you know I mean, I'm Nate, you went, to, you went to Nepal. You, you practically licked, licked doorknobs at JFK right at the beginning oh. of the coronavirus, oh, and yeah, you didn't get crazy. anything. I think those antibodies were built up pretty strong at that point. Well, you know what I did today, guys? Since we're sitting here in quarantine, uh, our new merch store just came online today. Whoa, Ooh, come on, this man. Is, this is it. And so I went on and bought about $130 worth of merch, <laughs> baby. Nice. It is good stuff. I got the new throw blanket that says Recovering Fundamentalist no Podcast. Way. <laughs> you can cover yourself with warmth with the Recovering Fundamentalist Podcast, literally and physically now. Do we get a discount because we're hosts? Nope. Come on, man. (laughs) (laughs) Got to make money. (laughs) Well, I want that mug. Mm. I did order one of those, too. Yeah, that mug looks really cool. However, I want to go ahead and air something out (laughs) because today... I knew it was coming. I went on the website, and I looked at the merch, and I am offended. (laughs) I am angry. Okay, JC has a snapback. It's called JC's Snapback. And yeah, then I, I scrolled on down, and Nathan has a trucker cap. It's yeah, almost like does. Nate. It's like Nate's trucker cap. <laughs> and then I, I keep scrolling, <laughs> and, and I have a visor. Yeah, what in the world buddy. is Ryan's up with that? Visor. <laughs> I felt like I was on the LPGA or something. Like, what? <laughs> a visor? Ball-headed men don't wear visors. What oh, are you doing man. to me? That's so funny. We were on there the other night. Listen, Brian, we actually FaceTimed uh, you with Justin Knight on the other night. You didn't get on. And so we were like, you know what? Let's just give Brian a visor and call it Brian Visor. Yeah. And so you got stuck with that. So That's sorry, buddy. That, that, was pretty, that was pretty brutal. Like, <laughs> I can't even direct my kids to the merch store because they'll <laughs> die with shame. Their dad has a visor. Hey, you watch 2020. The new trend is going to be visors. There's going to be a lot of people wearing visors because of the Brian visor. Oh, yeah. And today on Facebook, JC, you made a comment or somebody did about something that we hope to release in the future, and that is the Phil Kid tie. So we've got yes, that interview coming up very soon. How cool would that be to have a Phil Kid, the kid? Ty, you and know what I think would be awesome? Because we sent him, we sent him a T-shirt. It's to get him wearing the T-shirt, and that picture is what's on the tie, and it's just <laughs> called the kid. The kid. <laughs> I think yeah. that'd be hilarious. Did you see what he put out online? Oh yeah, he's coming after us, man. 
Did he call us loose lip liberals? Yeah. That's one of the nicer things that he called us. Man. By the way, have I'm, any of you guys gotten your pink pacifier in yet? Because I haven't. No, no. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, Nate, that, I got to be honest. That was some incredible quick photoshopping right there to change the logo to that pink pacifier. That was I think it was Justin Spurgeon's wife, Diane. She said, uh, whoever did that Photoshop should have taken the headphone jack and made it into a baby rattle. That would have been incredible. <laughs> oh, that would have been awesome. I thought it was pretty brilliant. I would have never thought of it. It was super cool. I loved it. Good photoshopping skills there, Nate. Thanks, bro. Hey, you can get your Recovering Fundamentalist merch today. We have coffee mugs. We have hats. We got T-shirts for men and for women. Hey, we have an RFP face mask. It's one of those neck gaiters. Yeah, Whoa. you can still wear a face mask if you're in one of those places where it's mandated and have a Recovering Fundamentalist podcast there. We got hats. We got Brian's visors. There's throw blankets. Go to recoveringfundamentalist.org slash merch and get your merch today. And the official RFP face mask is guaranteed not to stop the coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Authorized. Yes, <laughs> amen. <laughs> well, also, I think we need to thank our patrons. Man, they're, they're just really stepping up, and that's allowing us to have conversations about the ministry and the reach of RFP expanding and us being able to do more to impact people's lives personally. That that is exciting. I agree. And you know, I got on there this week and wrote a message to the patrons that you know, uh, with quarantine that I've been in, with all of us trying to get our schedules lined up. You know, we have incentives for each. Uh, tier that folks are given to and we're going to be getting those incentives out we got to record a three-song ep here yeah and uh you know nate you got to get your king james glossies because people are needing those i'm working on it dude <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a patron of patreon uh you are going to be getting your incentives real soon and we want to thank you for uh, being a part of the ministry that is the recovering fundamentalist podcast and i don't know about you guys but there has been a lot of messages that have come in this week that have just absolutely blown my socks off yes. just reminding us why we're doing what we're doing nate you got one of those yeah somebody that will remain unnamed message us today and said hey guys i stumbled upon your podcast one day and listened to the show with paul kidd someone in my family is very connected in the ifb world and i grew up going to a lot of the same camp meetings and revivals that paul did i've almost become an atheist because of my upbringing, questioning what I've been taught and not having a normal childhood. Your shows are making me rethink and reevaluate my relationship with God. I appreciate very much what y'all are doing. How cool is that? Man. Wow. That's that incredible. so good. I was able to share something back with him and just say, look, man, I've got a million and one stories about how people in the church have let me down and hurt me and disappointed me, but Jesus has never let me down. He's never disappointed me. That's why I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ because he is perfect. Amen to that. Y'all ready to get this show started? We got a great interview today. I'm ready. You ready? I'm fired yes, up. Let's go. Starts in three. You know what makes women stupid is college. Jesus was not a bartender. Hi, man. Two. You have lost your mind. Long tongue heifers have given me a lot more trouble than heifers wearing breeches. And you know that. Say amen right there. One. Let me tell you something, bozo. They'll be selling frosties in hell for this boy. Put on a pair of pink underwear. Amen. I sucked my thumb till I was 14 years of age. Hi, man. Everybody, thanks for listening to the Recovering Fundamentalist Podcast. We're your hosts, JC, Nathan, and Brian, and uh, it is good to have you here with us today. We've got an interview that we've been looking forward to for some time. we got Brian Townsend on uh, the podcast today, and uh, Nate, I heard that you are getting ready to head up to Danville, Virginia to hang out with Brian for the weekend. Yeah, man. Brian called me in and graciously invited me up to this conference. I mean, he's, he's putting on to help out pastors. And just real excited about going and spending some time with him. And then also Sunday, you're going to be sharing about the missions trip that you took to Nepal and how God allowed all of us to come together on that. So that's super exciting. So looking forward that's to awesome. it. It's going to be awesome. 
I'm a pastor. I didn't get invited. I don't need any <laughs> encouraging, I don't guess. You have the Rona. Like, wait, wait, JC. Oh, yeah, I got the Rona. Why aren't you coming? You didn't get your... I didn't golden, get an invite. You didn't get your engraved invitation? I didn't get the golden ticket to come to Danville. <laughs> I don't invite anybody with the Rona, man. I'm, t- I'm sorry. <laughs> and that'll, be, that'll be day 17 by then, so I'll be way gone with it. You can hop in the truck with me if you want to go. Absolutely. No, it's all right. I'll I'll wait for my invite to come preach. This is now the third time you've preached up there, and I haven't even been invited to <laughs> spend the weekend out. But it's okay. I'll get there eventually. <laughs> I love I can it. promise you that. All right, good. Well, Brian, you've known our guest today longer than Nate and I have, so why don't you go ahead and introduce him? Well, you know, Brian Townsend has been a friend of mine for a long, long time. And uh, actually, uh, our relationship is incredibly close. We talk several times a week. Um, Brian has, you know, referred to me as a father figure. He's given me that honor. He publicly refers to me and as his pastor, and he's been gracious about that. That's an honor that I don't deserve. And so Brian means a lot to me. And at this point, uh, we have a lot of life experience together. We've walked through some difficult times together. And, you know, I'm really loving the verse that a brother is made in adversity. There's something that happens when you walk through adversity together that makes you more than friends. It makes you makes you brothers. It makes you family. And so that's how I feel about Brian. So I'm excited uh, that Brian's on today. So Brian, why don't you introduce yourself today uh, to the listeners who may not be familiar with you? Why don't you walk us through your story? Well, I sure do appreciate you guys having me on today. And uh, I'm a big fan of the pod and um, listen most every Wednesday morning as I wake up and head to Starbucks and in the office. So um my name's Brian Townsend. I am uh, 35, almost 36 years young. I was born into a deacon's family. My dad was then a deacon and later a pastor. And there was not a time of my life that I don't remember being a Christian. I mean, I, I remember from a very young age being a believer. And even at a point in my life when I was a, a, a younger child, I remember what I believe to be my salvation experience and even the need in my heart. Like I remember one day I was at my mom and dad's house and I felt the desire to tell my mother that I had become a Christian, even as a, even as a kid and had most always um, loved the Lord with all of my heart. Um, when I was 12 years old, now you, you have to, you have to imagine a 12 year old, um, Every year, our church had a program, the church that my father pastored, where they would read the Bible through in a year. And I did that when I was 12 years old and a lot of confusion. I remember I got to Leviticus and broke down at 12 years old trying to read through that. <laughs> I, remember, I remember thinking, I still this, do that. I remember thinking, this is a weird book. But I persevered, and I read the Bible through for the first time when I was 12 years old, turning 13. And as far as running from the ministry, it's all I've ever wanted to do. When I was 12, 13, 14 years old, I I hope that the Lord would let me someday uh, be a preacher. And I actually enrolled in Bible college without knowing for sure that that's what the Lord wanted for me. I mean, I've had seasons of my life where I've been difficult and obstinate and knucklehead, but I've never really ran from the Lord. It's been something I've pursued most all my life. That's where I am to now, I guess. So walk us through, you're the pastor of Canvas Church. Um, The church wasn't always um, named Canvas. Uh, There was a different name on the sign at one point in time, and you followed a pastor. So why don't you walk us through the journey that led you to becoming the pastor of Canvas Church? So if you will back up to 2006, 2005, actually, um, I went to a couple of seminaries. One I went to was in Augusta, Georgia, not too far up the road from where I live now. And uh, there was a a guy that I went through school with who lived here in Athens. And I'm from West Virginia. I've never been to Athens. I'm not a Bulldog fan. I'm a mountaineer at heart. And uh, I came up here on a weekend and with the guy that lived here in Athens and through a long drawn out period of events, he was going to move back here and start a church. And i came out here to visit with him and fell in love with Athens at 19 years old. And God inexplicably tied my heart to this city. 
And um, he actually went up to the building that the church that I pastor now is in before his church even existed and prayed over the ground that God would give that to him. And uh, long story short, we got out of school and he ended up moving here and starting church in Athens. And that's how I became familiar with the Athens area. And I, I moved here in 2012 and took an existing church that had a very turbulent history. And uh, there was the pastor before me that did a really good job. And there was another pastor that um, things ended poorly. And um, but both of those pastors were very short tenured. And so I was the third pastor and the church was only six years old. Wow. So a lot of turnover and not always, I mean, turnover we talk about is so negative most of the time. And um, people took all their lumps out on me for their frustrations of turnover and not trust, you know, why trust him anyhow, three years, he's going to be gone again to somewhere better. And it was never my heart to do that. I was here from 2012 to 2017, five years. And, uh, finally one night we were a Baptist church and, um, very similar story to you all growing up in fundamentalism. And I had been beat and, and I had been beat to death for five years at this church. Just, just no trust, no, no, um, no gospel centered mission. Every, every man did that, which was right in his own eyes. Mm. And so I threw down the gauntlet January of 16, 17. My daughter was a year old and January the 16th, 2017. And I told the church, We're going to start over from the word scratch. We're going to be a biblically oriented church. We're not going to gossip. We have a terrible name in the community. Our name is Mud. I know of parents that won't let their kids come to the Bible school here because of all the drama that's gone on here. And I've pretty well said, you're either going to follow me. We're going to kill everything corporation-wise. We're going to kill the church, existing leadership structures. Everything about this doesn't work. And we're going to start over with a new corporation, new name, new everything, new vision. And that was in January 2017. And they all followed to kill New Haven Baptist Church and start Canvas, which was the term we came up with. And the idea was that God can take anything broken and make a masterpiece out of it, something Mm -hmm. beautiful. And I've been here ever since through many dangerous toils and snares. But that's the story of Athens in a nutshell. So, Brian, I'll never forget the day that you called me. And it was a difficult conversation. During that conversation, you wept. Uh, It was obvious that your heart was broken. You were living through circumstances that you never dreamed. And it was through that phone call that you learned things that you didn't want to know. It, It was difficult. Why don't you share with our listeners about the most difficult days of your life and what that involved? So I grew up in a very conservative culture that... You know, once you get married, you get married for life. And I I grew up not understanding what divorce was. You know, growing up as a preacher's kid, you're you're almost, I don't know that we're trained to do this, but we implicitly look at divorced people as a secondary citizen for those that are in the church. And we don't understand it. We don't give people proper education on it. And therefore there's a great misunderstanding and even almost a schism, not a schism, a, um, a a preexisting dogma within ourselves of people that experience divorce and come out of that. And I even almost felt somewhat like I didn't understand it growing up and how I relate to them. But so these, through these series of events, one morning, woke up, everything was normal and pretty well learned in a day that I was going to be going through a divorce. And it was the most gut wrenching process of my life. Um, people are not supposed to, to, to go, God didn't design it. So, you know, we, we were created, I think certainly for companionship and just the realization of that led to me becoming a divorced person And my church was gracious and allowed me to continue to pastor. But I certainly had to learn the hard way that that is the most traumatic experience that I've ever been through. And the Lord used that to really teach me how to have grace and mercy to people. Mm, That's good, Brian. I know a lot of people in the background that we all four grew up in, most of them believe that 
divorce in and of itself, no matter what the circumstances, immediately disqualifies anybody from being a pastor. And I do not believe that is biblical. And I know that some people will go and quote the King James uh, being the husband of one wife. But if we're going to put that much of a legalistic bent on that scripture, then Paul, the apostle, the writer of that, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was not qualified to be a pastor because he wasn't married. So uh, I'm just wondering, you know, have you dealt with backlash of people basically uh, saying that you're <laughs> you're laughing. So I know the answer, but saying that you're not even qualified to be a pastor. Oh, only always, only <laughs> always, <laughs> only and I, always. And I don't want to, you know, make light of it. I know it was a very, very difficult time in your life, and I know it's something you would have never chosen for yourself and never thought you would be there. But there is life after divorce, and I know that you are a man of character. And I know that you have maintained that and your people know that you're a man of character. That's why you're still at the church. And just curious as to how that affected you moving forward as a pastor. Well, to begin with, I was a parent of a 15 month old little girl when that happened that um, I parent 50% of the time. And so I wasn't prepared for that, fellas. Y'all have girls, and you know how (laughs) that little girl kicks my butt every single day. Every single day. She's four now. Today was her first day of pre-K, and um, that was the greatest blessing of my life, being able to remain a father to her, Hmm. and uh, she's my first ministry. But uh, So to answer your question, um, early and often, I've faced opposition from the pastorate, Uh, There are people that come to the church and once they find out I'm divorced, will not come back. Mm. Um, I have to say that a lot of my, a good many of my friends that I grew up with were supportive of me, including those within fundamentalism. Um, But there were some knuckleheads. There are still knuckleheads that will ignore the other 13 qualifications, but you know, the one the husband of one wife, yeah. they'll harp on that one while they run their house into debt and oh, are yeah. terrible fathers and absent husbands and, you know, on down the line. But we're not here to talk about that, are we, fellas? <laughs> no. And so, so no, we're uh, not. we'll just leave that alone <laughs> for another day. Yeah, I think that could make an entire episode Brian didn't know I was going to ask this question, but I do want to ask this because Brian Edwards has been so key in so many people's lives, including my own. So how important was Brian Edwards to your process of healing and continuing in the ministry that God had called you to after you went through this divorce? I would not be doing what I'm doing today if Brian were not in my life. Yeah. Mm. There are two men that God has used to shape and mold my life in these years. One is a man here local named Jeff Appling, Pastors of the Grove, and uh, the other over a distance is Brian. Um, Brian has held my hand from day one of that, day two of that, day three, um, to the point where I call Brian sometimes 1030 at night, interrupt his evening, um, And uh, I'm a paranoid individual and everything in my brain, the worst case scenario is what I create. (laughs) And uh, I'll call Brian and say, he'll say, shut up, you're fine. But (laughs) he has been a father to me and a pastor and has really taught me more by his example than anybody else has ever taught me in a classroom or any other sense. Mm. And hearing that, uh, he's going to make me cry. (laughs) Well, I believe um, honor should be given where honor is due. Yeah. And we do want to honor you, Brian. I know you have been key, not just in my life, JC's life, and Brian Townsend's yeah, life, it. but in. <laughs> 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 Thanks for breaking up a real tender moment there, JC. <laughs> but I do know that More you of have a grandfather been. grandfather for me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I do know man. you have been key in thousands of men's lives. And um, I want to honor you for yeah. that. Well, that means a lot. You know, God, God gave me three daughters. He didn't see fit to give me a son. And so when, for example, Brian, he gets close to my heart and he's a part of my life. The question I ask myself is, you know, what would I want to say to my son? If God had given me a son and he were in ministry, how would I guide him? How would I love him? You know, what would I, 
what, what I want to say to him about his present and his future. And so when I talk to Brian, you know, I usually say, I know I'm not your dad, but, but if I were, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I would tell you. And, and Brian, one huge aspect of your life is the story of your exodus from fundamentalism. Yeah, I wanted to ask him, at what point did you become a loose-lipped liberal? Okay. <laughs> so the, the process starts for me. I'm 19 years old. You guys, like, I don't, Brian, I don't even think you know this story. Batten down the hatches. <laughs> so I am at a Bible school, and I won't tell you the name of it. If you email me privately, I'll reveal it, but I won't <clears> say <throat> it over the pod. <clears throat> Uh, no, prior to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, you guys remember like at Temple, remember how you were required to go mandatory soul winning an hour a week? Oh, yeah. And so every semester, you know, I would get the graveyard shift Tuesday to 2.30 2 in the afternoon when everybody's at work and you, you have to go out and just knock on doors and nobody's home. Well, so that was my a lot. I think this was my spring semester, my sophomore year. Um, I was required to go on Tuesdays. Well, one day I had to work on Tuesday, so I went on Wednesday instead. <laughs> Temple. <laughs> <laughs> I went on Tuesday instead and got demerits for going soul winning on the wrong day. Oh, my word. <laughs> uh, you got demerits the, for soul winning on the wrong day. That is the gospel truth. <laughs> and as I looked over those demerits, I thought – there's something not right here, y'all. There's something, there's something not right here. You're, you get That's the best one I've ever heard. For, tell, for going soul winning on the wrong day. At that point in my life, I thought, this is not for me. <laughs> I got in trouble once at Temple. We had this thing where we called it soul winning Thursday or something like yeah. that. And we went outside and there was, 300 of us, I don't know how many, we tied tracks to balloons and we let them go, but all the balloons got stuck in the power lines and started like, <laughs> and so all these tracks are just hanging in the power lines and it was hilarious. And I put it on video and got in trouble because I was sued by vice president and they didn't think it was funny. <laughs> but they tend, that was Temple. They tend not to uh, be happy about those things. <laughs> I'm picturing JC standing on the street holding this huge video yes. camera. Because that's before cell phones had cameras on them. So I'm picturing JC out there filming the power lines. Uh, it was fun. Well, Brian, here's, here's all I would say. If I were you, I would wear getting demerits like a crown. I would wear that like a crown. Uh, that's, that's what I would do. Come on, Bishop. Come on, Bishop. Yeah. But, uh, you know, your exodus from fundamentalism, you and I have walked through that together as well. And, and seeing you grow and, and Brian, you know, I don't think people understand uh, the depth of the well that you are. Uh, Brian is a, an intellectual guy. He's a student. If you want to make him really happy, give him a great book, give him a journal, give him a Bible, give him a journal, give him a good cup of coffee, a pen. And, and Brian is a real student. And uh, Brian, I know that you've been studying a lot. And recently, you've been rocking my world with some Bible history and the fact that that's rocking your world. I think it'd be really good for our listeners. I know we don't dive into Bible history often. But this will be Bible history on the RFP. Uh, Brian is going to guide us into some, rather than Bible history, I guess I should say church history. Yeah. And uh, let's listen closely because this, this is really educational, and it's, it shook him, and it shook me. Okay. So I guess I'm going to interview you three for a few minutes here, and we'll just we'll talk about this for a minute. I like um, it. People, people ask me why I left fundamentalism. And it was not a matter of me wanting to loosen dress standards. It was not a matter of me wanting to have a church with cool lights or rock and roll music. It was not a matter of me lessening up. It was the matter of me examining God's word and, and, you know, developing, you know, my own conviction, you know, Martin Luther in 1521, stood before the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V of Spain. Martin Luther's 37, the Holy Roman Emperor's 21, and the emperor is demanding that he recant. And Luther, at this point, has, has hammered his 95 thesis to the castle at Wittenberg, but he didn't get a lot of traction until a year or two later. 
And finally, this, this diet of worms is called, and uh, we, we talk about a diet of worms for those that are new to church history. That's not a can of worms that you eat. The diet of worms was a conference at a, at a town called Worms. And Martin Luther, before the Holy Roman Emperor, makes the comment, speaking of his position on why he won't recant. Listen to this. And he's again here talking for, this is the man that blew the lid off of the Protestant Reformation. This is the man that led us to justification by faith alone, that that led the surge of sola scriptura back to the study of scripture alone. No pope, no tradition. This is just a revival back to the scriptures. And he's before the Holy Roman Emperor and makes these comments. And he goes, since then, your serene majesty and your lordship seek a simple answer I will give it in this manner, neither horned nor toothed. He said, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in the councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradict themselves. Listen to this. He said, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. Mm. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Wow. Wow. And I am who I am today, not because I have desired to be a, a, a hipster, although I like being a hipster. I am not who I am today <laughs> because I desired cool lights in church, although I like that. I'm not who I am today because I wanted to have conferences instead of revivals. I am who I am today. Just like Martin Luther said, my conscience is captive to the word of God. It's a sin to go against your conscience. And who who I am today is a matter of conviction, Mm. not a matter of it was a cool decision and I wanted to do that. That brings up an interesting point because so many of the legalist pastors that speak out against us that want us to preach on the exact same things they preach on. They're actually asking us to sin because we're not convinced of those things in our own conscience. That's, let, let, that's very ironic. I, I'm trying to remember the context of the scripture. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Yeah, absolutely. And, and while we're on church history, I did want to throw in two ideas to make your patron program really skyrocket. I guarantee that your, your patronage will go through the roof by 400%. Come on. JC, I think we need to begin <laughs> by adding an option for $17.69 a month. Oh, yeah. Let the actual <laughs> version of the King James Version that we have today. Oh, somebody's head just exploded. <laughs> yes. And then that would free up the $16.11 a month gift that you have, that that could be reflective of the first year that Thomas Helwes wrote the, the first Baptist confession of faith, where he authorized women to be deacons. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh-oh. So I think if you did that, <laughs> where's the heresy horn? <laughs> would go through the roof. Um, so you're welcome for that. That's free. And I, I the Thanks. Brian Townsend guarantees 300%. Yes, sir. You said 400%. 400%. But, yes, sir. So, so you left fundamentalism. Yeah. And, and by the way, I know it said frequently, thank God for our heritage. Thank God for our heritage. Well, I'll be the one to come out and say, I don't thank God for my heritage. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I can give you about 50 reasons why uh, the heritage that I was brought up in was unhealthy, unscriptural. And wasn't good for me as a young believer. Uh, and, I, and by the way, I'm offended by all those guys who say, well, fundamentalism was good enough to get you saved. Yeah. No, the gospel was yeah, good enough on. to get me saved. Yeah, come on. And so you, you left your heritage. And I think a lot of people would know that your brother is C.T. Townsend. Yeah. Your brother is still very much an independent Baptist fundamentalist. So there's differences between you and him. You're obviously not where he is. So specifically, what are some of the things that you would say after having studied church history and, and God's word, I'm not a fundamentalist. These things right. led me away from it. Well, I would say two things that um, to lump all fundamentalists in the same group is, you know, you cannot say that Peter Ruckman is uh, Billy. The same Sunday, as Lee Robertson. B- Billy, yeah. Lee Robertson. Yeah. Um, and I consider my brother, like, I don't consider him to be a, he's a camp meeting evangelist, but I don't consider him a fundamentalist in the aspect that so many of them are toxic. I, I think there's a fine line of demarcation between a good many, but the movement of fundamentalism as a whole, I think that 
there's way too much emphasis within fundamentalism on performance. And, and let me go back to Martin Luther for a minute. Uh, Martin Luther grew up as a young man. His father beat him. And his teachers whipped him for not knowing his assignments. And so he came out of childhood with a very abusive view of authority. And Martin Luther listened to this statement that I've got this as well. And I'm going back to how fundamentalism is very heavy on performance and repeat conversions and doubting your salvation and heavy. And we, you know, really justified by, by grace through faith alone. Luther wrote of the overwhelming experience of celebrating his first mass. So this is the point where he's the Catholic priest literally observing or distributing the Eucharist and the Catholic believed that, you know, the, the communion, the bread and the body literally became the body and the blood of Christ as the priest touched it. Right. And they believed that and some still do. They believe that as he touched it. So literally they were sacrificing afresh the blood and body of Christ mm. every Sunday, every time they met, we'll not go into that, but, and he was convinced that he was, uh, he was so overwhelmed the first time he offered Mass, holding and offering of the very body of Christ. He was convinced that he was not doing enough to be saved. He wrote that God seemed to, be, seemed to him to be a very severe judge, much as his father and teachers had been earlier in life. He thought that God would ask for an account later in life just to find him wanting like God was some petty, angry, vindictive man that just wanted to send him to hell and laugh about it. Luther believed that in order to be saved from the wrath of God, somebody had to take advantage of the sacraments that the church offered because the the Catholic church believed and taught that the sacraments administered grace. They built up my grace bank so that that helped pay for my sins. They believe that salvation is a work both of God and uh, the, the, the sacraments, which is synergism. It's not monergism mm-hmm. where we believe that, you know, God, salvation is a result of God alone, whereas synergism teaches that it's human will and God's will together. But so, so Luther believed, he, he wrote that if sins had to be confessed and forgiven, listen to this, there was always the horrifying possibility that he might forget some sin during confession and thus lose the reward after which he was so diligently striving. He therefore spent hours listing and examining all his thoughts and actions, and the more he studied, the more he found sin in them. So before confession, he would do his best to memorize all of his sins and go and confess them and then get home and realize he hadn't confessed them all. And he just the mental torment of, is my sin paid for? What does that sound like to you? Mm. Fundamentalism. Oh, I, this sin's not forgiven because I forgot about this. I didn't confess this sin. So at the Bema seat, I'm going to give account for this one. I did. I confessed this one, so we're good there, but I didn't confess this one. And the performance and the guilt that laid on Luther is the same thing we fight today. Right. It actually sounds like a camp meeting invitation. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so st- stuff like that. Um is just unacceptable to me. You know, I mean, whereas again, people that are in fundamentalism, if they feel like that's what God has for them, go on, rock on, do what you do. Um, but for me, I look at the, the, the system on performance and it, it, it's just a trap. It's a trap that you can never escape. It's a hamster wheel. It's a treadmill mm-hmm. that you can never get off of. And finally, when are we going to learn that the cross really did appease the wrath of God on humanity? Amen. The wrath of God was yeah. satisfied in the cross and it's not a sacrament and the Baptist way of dressing right, acting right, talking right, or we don't run and we don't chew. We don't run with them that do independent, oh, yeah. fundamental, premillennial, landmark, all tenements, indigenous, autonomous, flag waving, Woo. patriotic, all that stuff we throw on it. That Ooh, does not save me. <laughs> that does not save me. You know, it's the blood of Jesus and the gospel that forgives us and pardons us and gives us freedom to not live in the fear of, did I forget this sin or did I forget that sin? But it's that Jesus died. And that's it. You know, he buried, (laughs) rose again. And that really is enough. And we don't have to live Mm. with this condemnation. Daily life like Luther, did I do enough today? Mm. Wow, that's so good. So, Brian, as you've studied church history, and we've talked about this, in what ways do you see fundamentalism being exactly like 
the uh, ancient Catholic church. I, you don't even have to say, we've had that conversation, but you don't even have to say ancient Catholic. You can say modern Catholic, but which by the way, if there's one group, who is it that the fundamentalists hate the most? The Catholics. <laughs> the Roman Catholics. <laughs> you know, the, the, we've all seen them do the head hurts, stomach hurts, can't find my cigarettes to mock them. You know, we've all seen them do that. Um, doctrinally, let's talk about this, the doctrinal similarities, the parallels. Um, the obsession of Bible versions and the extreme positions that both fundamentalists and Catholics take. Mm. In 382 AD, a man named Jerome translated the Bible from the, the original manuscripts from Greek into Latin, Hebrew and Greek into Latin, and that became known as the Vulgate. And the Romans, even in like French speaking or German speaking nationalities, during the Mass, they would read the scripture from the Latin Vulgate, even if the people couldn't understand it. And the Council of Trent, which is right after the the Reformation started, affirmed from the Roman Catholics from from Rome that the Vulgate was the only translation, was the translation that they would use. And it was not a biblical language. But so what what do fundamentalists love to ascribe to? King James, KJVO. King James Bible. Um, let, me, let me throw a couple things at you here that you may or may not know. Did you know that the KJV exists in part out of a semi-protest to the Latin-only movement of the Catholic Church? Mm. No. Yeah, you had the, the European nations starting to bow up when, when nationalism starts about the 16th century. Um, the King James movement in the English, which was one of the first nations to break, you know, with the Anglican Church, King Henry VIII, um, they broke from the Catholics, and it was out of a semi-protest of the Latin-only movement. Now, let's go here a minute. We all know that the original King James has what in it that does not have it today? Apocrypha. The Apocrypha. Do you know why that's in there? King James, his nation was divided politically, not politically, but religiously, between Catholics and Protestants. And King James put the Apocrypha in the original 1611 to appease the Catholics and to appease the Protestants to get them to get along. (laughs) (laughs) And so doctrinally, extreme versions, they they parallel. So everybody that came out of the Reformation was coming out of the Catholic Church. Not, well, boy, let's talk about that. We'll call Baptist Protestants. We'll all get hung up tomorrow um, by our toenails. Um, Haven't you ever read The Trail of Blood? Oh, buddy, buddy. All those heretics they associate with back through the the millennia. So the Catholics have always had a three-legged table, a three-pronged approach to how they do church authority. Uh, One is tradition that the apostles have passed down, scripture and papal authority, the authority of the pope, to speak ex cathedra in the place of God and the Pope as he speaks, it's as inspired as the writings of Paul. Pretty Mm -hmm. arrogant if you ask me, but so that's what they claim, papal authority, tradition, and scripture. Fundamentalists, like all Protestants, claim sola scriptura, scripture alone. Y'all with me? Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. They will claim scripture only, sola scriptura, but then claim non-scriptural issues as doctrine. For example, (laughs) KJV, not mentioned in the scriptures. Women have to wear dresses, not mentioned in the scripture. Anyone that asks questions about fundamentalist tradition is not allowed, not in the scripture. Let's talk about this one, the old time religion, Mm. not in the scripture. Old paths. Old past, Jeremiah 6, 16, I can do all things through verses taken out of context. Say amen, <laughs> church. Uh, we, we'll talk about the hymns. We can only sing music that was written in the 1600s, 17, 1800s. Let's talk about this. So none of those are found in the scripture. Let's talk about altar calls. Uh-oh. Altar calls. Where'd that come from? Second Great Awakening, Charles Finney, who at times was mostly heretical. He was the guy that used the anxious seat in the Second Great Awakening to get people to respond. Charles Haddon Spurgeon refused to do altar calls. He would do invitations, but would have people make appointments to talk about their salvation on Tuesday evenings because his philosophy was if somebody cannot wait 48 hours to talk about their soul, what they got, what they did on Sunday morning during an invitation, was not enough to save them if they didn't come back and want to follow up, you know, on Tuesday. I, I heard something on a podcast uh, called History and Hope by, yeah. a game, by a guy named Matthew Lyon, who is a, like, I cannot understate, overstate how much I've drunk from his well. 
how great he is. And he goes through stuff and he's, he's got a PhD and um, great guy, great guy. And so he does this podcast and he does the, the entire oral history on the altar call. He, he's talking about guys that are very pro invitation, but not necessarily an altar call. And so Martin Lloyd Jones, who, who was from Wales, ministered in England, I believe in the 1800s. Awesome. Tells a story about how he was preaching a night service. And you guys have all done this when you look out and you see someone who's visibly distraught while you're preaching. Martin Lloyd Jones t- tells a story that he didn't pray with the man. He just felt like, you know, sometimes that just happens and the man leaves. Well, the next day, the preacher runs into the same man who is very visibly distraught. And uh, the preacher, Jones, looks at this man and says, you know, we didn't pray together last night. And the man looks at him and said, you know, if you had asked me to stay, I would have prayed, implying giving his life to Christ. And the preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, looks at him and says, well, sir, we can pray now. And the guy looked at him and said, you know what? I, I think I'm okay today. I, I don't think I need that. <laughs> And Jones makes the statement, if what he was facing Sunday night did not stick 24 hours to the next day, he was not under conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so we do the one, two, three prayer, come forward and never see him again. You know, Brian, that's interesting that you, you brought up that story because one of the things that before we started this podcast, honestly, right as we were getting ready to go, sitting at a camp meeting and I watched this kid go to the altar, no joke, 15 times on one night. The next night, come back, he went to the altar 15, 16, 17 times. I don't know how many. I mean, it was visibly like watching him go to the altar and come back. And when somebody would go, he'd go pray with them. The next night, he gets saved at this said meeting. And I was like, wait a second, what about the 30 times before the last two nights that you went to the altar? What what happened there that, you know, you got saved on this side? And I'm not d- discrediting the fact that he may have actually gotten saved and God could have been working on his heart. But there's such this draw of the altar, of going down to it. There, It, it really, honestly, I struggled with this. It, it became yeah. a very outward sign of pleasing people around me. I can remember, man, so many nights going to camp meetings and going to revivals and I would go down to the altar at the end and I'm not even kidding with you. I would yawn to try to get a tear to come up in my eye because I I was like, what am I doing here? And I remember standing up and just how that was kind of just this man-made, I needed their approval that I went to the altar. I can remember sitting in youth groups. I think I've shared this before and you know, Tracy or Bubba or Dale being like, hey, won't you go get broken on the altar so we can go down to play volleyball or something, you know, because that was like the whole goal was we're not leaving here until somebody's broken on the altar and our youth pastor was waiting on somebody to come down. Yeah. So I was like, we're doing paper, rock, scissors while everybody's heads are bowed. I'm like, I'll go to the altar tonight. You were know? a heathen, just, JC. <laughs> I, I, I really was. I was yawning, trying to get a tear. I'm such a heathen. <laughs> I was teaching through Acts chapter 10 about a month ago, and it's a story of where Cornelius prays and God tells him that Peter's going to come. Then the Holy Spirit tells Peter to go. And so he goes, and this is the door opening for the Gentiles to believe and be invited into the family of, of believers and to become Christians. After Peter obeys, goes and preaches a sermon to Cornelius, uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. And it goes on down in verse 47. And Peter says, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So what we see in that passage is as Peter is preaching the gospel in their hearts at some point, they believe and they immediately are saved. And we know that because then the Holy Spirit falls on them and comes into their heart and then they take the next step and they're baptized. So I I believe 100% you should always make an offer of repentance and always call people to believe the gospel, but to try to manipulate It's like you're saying the difference in an altar call and an invitation, trying to manipulate. Yeah. There's, there's something about that that discredits the gospel and implies that the gospel is not enough. And the power of God is not in the gospel, but in the band standing in the pulpit. 
either you believe that the gospel is the power of God to salvation or you don't. Yeah. And over invitationalizing people is proof that either you didn't preach the gospel <laughs> or hmm. you don't believe that it truly is powerful enough to save and it needs your help and your assistance and your sensationalizing. It's one or the other. Did any of you guys grow up in churches where they would sing like 42 verses of just as I am until <laughs> enough people came to the altar? Totally. Oh yeah. And I'm 42 is not a made up number. I counted. <laughs> I think that's the highest we ever got. Well, I went to Tennessee Temple when the great revival of Tennessee Temple University happened, and they sang the song, The Altar. I am not kidding you. That that revival lasted. That revival lasted, what, a month? And they sang The Altar 10, 15 times a night, like the entire song. And, you know, it was ridiculous sitting there. And, I mean, there were people – at that some point, and I'm not discrediting that, you know, the salvations that happened, but there were people sitting there when they were just singing that song over and over and over and over again yeah. that were coming down and, you know, mama's getting saved and daddy's getting saved and the president of the university was getting saved and truck drivers pulling over and getting saved. But it was just song after song after song over and over and over again. And it, it got you to a point where you're like, man, if we sing this again, I may doubt my salvation. <laughs> Would it be inappropriate to mention that the guy that was preaching was sleeping with multiple women while oh, that revival was man. going on? Oh, that's terrible. Mm. It should have gone and gotten saved. Yeah. Mm. So, Brian, your list of all of the ways that fundamentalism and Catholicism resemble one another, it's a huge list. If we were to pause on every point like we did this one, we would be here forever. Can I hit so, the real fast? Why don't you just read through the okay. list? All right. I think you so, should. So doctrinally, we've talked about the obsession of Bible versions, extreme positions, the Vulgate, um, emphasis on tradition. Remember the Catholic Church, tradition, Scripture, papal authority, fundamentalism, claim, Scripture alone, sole scriptura. But then they talk about KJV dresses, uh, question the man of God, old-time religion, altar call, Sunday school, Wednesday evening, guardians of all things, preference. Uh, your salvation is questioned. If you don't fall in line, the Catholics will excommunicate you or anathematize you mm. if you disagree with them. And the man of God can question your salvation if you don't line up with what he says. Quickly, I'll, I'll double back on these. Within the Catholic Church, Middle Ages, and even now, there was a distinct mark. of There's a line of demarcation between uh, clergy and the laity, how the clergy appeared to be the the you know the popes the vicar of Christ he speaks at the cathedra you know traditionally there have been three forms of church government you know you have your presbyterian model which is elder led you have your congregationalist which is led often by your congregation and then there's the type of government that the roman catholics dictate to which is an episcopal type church government mm -hmm. where ultimately there's one man wherein lies all the power mm -hmm. um, What's that sound like? <laughs> Fundamentalism. Not all fundamentalists. Some fundamentalists have deacons and maybe a plurality of leadership, but all one man has all the power. He's unquestioned. The priest literally had the keys of heaven and hell, could withhold communion from you. You, have, you talked about the Pope withholding communion, well, the, the um, sacraments from kings of nations, and making the kings, Pope Innocent III, would make nations bow to him, or he would withhold communion, thus mm. depleting their grace bank and eliminating their ability to live holy and be saved through the works of that. Let's be honest, how, how, many, how many fundamentalists do we know that isolate you, separate you, blackball you, blackline you for not doing exactly as they say? So there's that's when you that. get That's when you get churched. Oh, yeah. Come on with it, Reverend. <laughs> um, you know, and, and let me say this. I do believe there are offices within the church, but those offices have great authority or great limits on their authority. You know, my, my authority as an elder, as a pastor, as a shepherd is to teach the word. Um, God didn't call me out of necessity. He didn't need me. He, you know, God had to have me. You know, how many times have you heard this statement? I would have to step down to take the office of the president of the United States from being a God called preacher. Mm. A bunch of times. You know, we have this moral superiority to the highest elected office in the land that we're better than them because God called us to preach. 
I'll rattle this saber real fast. I'm already going to get hate mail, death threats probably. <laughs> um, so we've talked, we've talked about Latin. You know, the, the, the Roman Catholics were all about Latin culture. This is fascinating. In the West, Latin was the only kind of church. They claimed Peter uh, as their founder through medieval term, times. Most people could not read during the weekly mass. As I've said, they would read the scriptures in Latin to German speaking, to French speaking, to English speaking people. People couldn't hear the scriptures in their native tongue. And then the, the priests and the popes could say whatever they want to as commentary with zero way to fact check them Mm. and would Latinize the culture to death. And whenever people could learn to read the scriptures for themselves, such as Erasmus, such as Luther, such as Zwingli, such as Calvin, they began to split from the Catholic church because they saw that the Latin Roman way of doing things was so wrong and the Latin culture being forced. Let's go a little bit further here. What's double inspiration? (laughs) False. (laughs) <laughs> okay, what is it? It's, it's believing worth- that the translators of the King James Bible were as equally inspired as the writers. And again, your Ruckmanites believe this, but not everybody does. Oh, I can't, I'm, those guys are going to come at me. They're vicious. So the Ruckmanite, <laughs> you know, the devil inspiration that just because people spoke English, they were as inspired as the Apostle Paul. So there's that. Um, I've told people before that that is the weakest argument for the King James controversy to promote a group of guys, a group of translators to be more holy than the ones that have translated other versions, because we know that all people are depraved. We know that all people are sinful. We know that all people, we're all pastors. We, we know how we are. It's ridiculous. So individualism that has so crept into American churches. Do you know what, what people, why people love America? Because I, I can do whatever I want to with no, with no accountability. We love that. And America is great. So fundamentalism connects to American nationalism so much that America, that we become Americans first rather than Christian. Woo. How many videos have we seen of guys singing songs at camp meetings and somebody grabs an American flag and goes oh, running around man. the, yeah. oh, I, Nathan, I just sent you a video yeah. this week of, of a tent revival that has maybe 15, 20 people in it, but they're running around with an American flag and it has nothing to do with the song that's being <laughs> sung. Well, how many times have we seen the church get fired up because somebody sings, and I'm proud to be an American, where at least, I mean, you know, man, you want to get people fired up, you just break out the Lee Greenwood. Dude, I was getting fired up right then. <laughs> so, so <laughs> the national the, anthem of the church, amen. <laughs> so the Catholics love to force Latin culture on people just because, I mean, people in distant lands thousands of miles away. You must embrace our way. You must embrace this. And so we want to harp on old time religion, the American 1950s. And we want to force that on Hispanic speaking (laughs) people in Miami. We want to force that. We want people in other languages to, for their scripture to be translated from our King James Bible because it was double inspired. Like, does it occur to y'all that God did not have the English speaking people in mind only when he created the heavens and earth absolutely yeah as a matter of fact um i was preaching a little while back that god is for one kingdom and that is his own people just need to go ahead and accept that one day when god melts the earth with a fervent heat the american flag will burn beside of the iraqi flag it'll burn beside of the russian flag america will burn like every other nation when God melts the earth with a fervent heat and the kingdom of God will stand. Brian, don't you already have enough enemies? Yeah, no joke. I just (laughs) ready to say, here come the emails. (laughs) Oh man. Well, it's just the truth. (laughs) It's the truth. But there's more than a few similarities between the Catholics and the fundamentalists. So definitely. Well, Brian, I appreciate you being open and sharing with us. And, uh, and I can say this, you know, as having been your friend for a long time and having had a lot of conversations with you, Brian didn't even scratch the surface. It's just great to see young guys like you 
who have a passion for God's word, who have a heart for the church and God's using you. And I just want to say, and I think I can speak for all three of us when I say this, regardless of what you've been through, um, I think God uh, is definitely using you. I think he will continue to use you. Uh, the, the statement, everything rises and falls on leadership. is not correct. Everything rises and falls on integrity. Hmm. And I pray that you would continue to have great integrity because they're great leaders who have no integrity and they've fallen. Yeah. And so I pray that in spite of the fact that your circumstances are difficult and where life has you right now is in some ways difficult. I pray that God would continue to, uh, to call you to walk in integrity and you'll obey him in that. Yeah. And Brian, would you have something to say to people who love the Lord, who are walking with Jesus, but they have gone through a difficult divorce they have gone through the loss of something and they're trying to be single parents. Is there something you could say to people who are living in a church culture that looks at them as secondhand citizens? I would say to you that you matter, that you are the, God doesn't have any second rate children. Mm. God doesn't have any children that he looks at with less value. We are equally valued. And it's hard when you are pushed to the margins and there's some people that won't talk to you just because of situations. I feel sometimes like a blind man that Christ gave his sight back to. Mm. I feel sometimes like a crippled man that the Lord restored. And I, I know through divorce and I, I have three children in heaven as well. And um, a long story of, so many forks and I want to tell each of you that you matter to the Lord. And I never knew the Lord as a father until I've walked this road of brokenness. He was the God of other people before then. And I am three years removed from my divorce. I am happier than I have ever been in my life. Mm. I have never been more fulfilled as a father and a pastor. And someday I pray a husband shout out. I am a single dad. If any ladies listen, Save um, single sanctified and searching. Yeah. Amen. yeah. <laughs> single and ready to flamingo y'all. And, uh, <laughs> but, but I have a few dating service. Yeah. <laughs> I refuse to do the new ifb.com single. <laughs> that was um, my next question. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for those of you that have been pushed to the margins through divorce or abuse or have been through any kind of systems that have broken your walls down and, and pushed you away so that other people used you for anything, I want to tell you that you matter. And that the Lord loves you so very much. You know, I, I, I tell people sometimes my story and they say, and you're still a Christian after all that. Mm. Mm. And the answer is resoundingly yes. That faith is forged in difficulty, not green pastures. So if you will, and you matter. And I'll be praying for every listener of the RFP that God would heal your heart of every broken thing that's happened to you. And there is a time that will come that God can restore that season. And I'm happier than I've ever been. Mm -hmm. I love my life. I love my daughter. I love my church. I started graduate school today. My little girl started pre-K today. I've cried eight times today and lost it, but I've (laughs) never been happier in my life. And there is hope Mm -hmm. no matter what you've been through. Mm -hmm. It's good. And that is powerful, Brian. So many times in scripture, we see that it's religion that pushes people away. But Jesus is always the one who draws people in because he loves the broken. And I remember this song our choir used to sing, and I'm not real big on Southern gospel music, as you guys all know. I'm a loose lip liberal. But one of the songs I remember (laughs) that uh, I think is so powerful is the song, A Trophy of Grace. Yeah. Because there's nothing in me that I have to offer God before I was a Christian or after I am a broken person. But while religion has let me down, while people have let me down, Jesus has never 
ever yeah, right. let me down. And there is not one listener that is tuning into this today or at some point in the future that Jesus does not want to do his redeeming work through the gospel in your life. So please, whatever it is you're walking through, allow it to draw you into a deeper relationship with Jesus. Go deeper in his word than you've ever gone before. Find out who Jesus really was. Don't trust someone who tried to cram religion down your throat to tell you who the real Jesus is. He's there in scripture. You can find him. Yeah, man, that's a great word. And before we close this podcast out, guys, there's something that we need uh, to talk to Brian about. And it's really important. And as a matter of fact, uh, JC, it might be great if you could pray like some prayer of deliverance for him. (laughs) Brian has a serious addiction to Chick-fil-A and to Starbucks. (laughs) Every time you talk to him on the phone, he, he's always going to say the words inevitably. Hey, man, hold on for one second. Uh, yeah, I'd like a skinny latte with coconut milk and half the whipped oh, cream on, with the cherry on top. And make yeah. sure, make it, you know, he's always going to order a Starbucks drink. And then, you know, and you know good and well when, when you hear a guy pull up to the Starbucks and they're like, oh, hey, Brian, <laughs> you've already got it made. Just drive to the window. You know, then he goes a lot. Or you hear him say, you know, I'd like a number one or a number seven uh, with a lemonade or, or what. He's always ordering Chick-fil-A. So Brian it's has a serious addiction. It's all my daughter will addiction. eat. It's all my daughter will eat. And, yes, in many ways, I'm a basic white girl. I understand that. In many ways, <laughs> I'm a basic white girl. Um, I'm big on self-care. I like that. But my daughter makes me go to Chick-fil-A a lot in my defense. When you go to a Mexican restaurant, do you order ACP? I don't even know what that is. Okay, then, then good. That was a saving grace. <laughs> what is it? It's uh, Eros Campoya. And my daughter, you uh, know, it's the, no it's the chicken is. and rice and cheese. See, I what, do. We call that the basic white girl here at the <laughs> feast in Ringgold. Chicken, cheese, and rice. I'm like, give me the basic white girl, please. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I love it. Hey, Nathan, fun fact, you just mentioned Trophy of Grace. On J.C. Groves' album, Adoration, from 1998, that's the title song. You can no get it way. today. That, nice. uh, that, that album went aluminum. It was great. <laughs> hey, do you still have any copies of that? I would love to sell that on our merch store. I have burnt. Ooh, you know what? Maybe one. I think I have one. I will pay to reproduce it and put it on our merch store. No. That needs to happen. Listen, okay, here, <laughs> here's the deal. I won the Gold City Talent Search in 1998. I got... 14 hours in a studio with this guy and we got in there and we were recording it. They slowed my voice down like two steps. So if I'm singing huh, like that, it came out. Uh, so everything, it's like, I'm a trophy of grace. <laughs> like I'm on that opposite of helium. It is terrible. I will we're like 12 years thing. old. So they had to drop exactly. it down. I mean, <laughs> It's great. Hey, Brian, we want to thank you for being on the podcast with us today, man. You've got some incredible knowledge and and history and uh, just your story. And and I know that what you said there at the end is going to touch a lot of people's lives because there's a lot of folks who have given up hope. There's a lot of people that have thrown in the towel that feels like God's done with them because of their past. And uh, man, tomorrow needs you. And uh, we're excited. We want to cheer you on. And uh, I hope that you're encouraged from uh, the podcast tonight. Hey, we want to thank our sponsors here at the RFP Free Life Soap and J Radio. Thanks for sponsoring the show. Be sure to go to the recoveringfundamentalist.org. Click on our new merch store. You can get all kinds of new merch. Be sure to get the Brian Visor. It's going to be our top seller. I know it's going to happen. Uh, hold on i was gonna say something he just can't even right now he just can't even even. even. what do you say about having a visor Edwards was speechless what about and all it took was a visor Uh, with your visor you can also get the brian knickers and uh why don't we just why don't we just uh you know come up with the brian uh chacos why don't we just go ahead and just go all the way with this crocs Crocs. It could be a whole line is what it could become. (laughs) We'll just call it the B. Edwards. (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to love you jc but it's gonna oh i Jesus. love it hey next week we got a great uh phil kid part one him and paul are going to be joining us on the podcast and that is a two-parter you want to be sure to be here next wednesday your eyeballs for phil are kid. going to melt out of your head you are not ready for this 
Well, anytime it's somebody says, possible. you know, these three lemon juice drinking loop, loose lip liberal, you know, pansy. I mean, man, <laughs> he's already built this thing up. You need to tune in next week just for the intro. That in itself is going to be incredible. But it's going to be a great two-week uh, episode with Phil Kidd and his son, Paul Kidd, coming up next week on the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Guys, it has been good today. Brian Townsend, great to have you here with us. Thanks for stopping by. We'll have to get you back on and continue to dive into church history in the future. I'd love to have it. Thank you all for having me tonight. All right. Thanks for being here with us on the Recovering Fundamentalist Podcast. Y'all have a great week. Be sweet. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Recovering Fundamentalist Podcast. Be sure to stop by our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Give us a follow. Also, go to our website, recoveringfundamentalist.org. That's recoveringfundamentalist.org. There you can find Recovering Fundamentalist swag. You can get your t-shirts and hats. You can join our ex fundy community. See where we're going to be having some meetups. It's the recoveringfundamentalist.org. Be sure to join us next time for the Recovering Fundamentalist Podcast.